Thank you very much indeed, Mr. President, um, and welcome to each and every one of you. Um, what I've been asked to talk about is developing surgical education in low and middle income countries, and I say straight away that I shall confine my comments to Africa, as virtually every sub Saharan country in Africa comes into that category. I'll also focus down a little bit on East Africa because I can't cover the whole lot in the time available. Now, what I will do is go through a bit of background uh, for those of you who don't know Africa very well. Uh, we'll then discuss the need for surgery and why we're discussing this topic at all. We'll then go through the training of surgeons in East Africa, uh, and then some of the problems and how we deal with the problems. So straight away, a lot of countries in Africa are faced with a critical shortage of health workers. We need to increase them by about 140%, and that equates to about a million more health workers alone in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa itself. And if you look at this uh, uh, diagram here, you can see that Africa, top left, which has 24% uh, of the global burden of disease, but only 3% of the global workforce. Compare that with the Americas, who have 10% of the global burden of disease, but 37% of the global health workforce, and you can see there's a slight problem somewhere. Only a fraction of uh, 234 million operations are performed a year are undertaken in the poorest third which is what we're talking about. Uh, surgical conditions make up about 11% of the global burden of disease. And of that 11%, the vast majority are injuries or injury-related. Malignancies are creeping up, as they are everywhere, people living longer. Complications of pregnancy is a major problem in Africa. And congenital abnormalities are much commoner there than they are in the United Kingdom. And the sad thing is that 80% of deaths from these conditions, which are partially treatable by surgery, occur in Africa. About two billion people in the world have no access to surgical care. I've got no idea how they work out these estimations, but uh, you just take them as read. And more than 60% have no access to emergency drugs. Now, the need for surgery is enormous. Uh, injury of all sorts kills 4.5 million people a year, accounting for one in 10 of all deaths. 90% of those occur in low middle income countries, such as Afri in Africa. And there we have the highest road traffic injury mortality in the world 28 per 100,000, 50 deaths per 10,000 vehicles, compared with 1.7 in high-income countries. And the problem is that as these countries in Africa get more prosperous, uh, they get hold of cars, but they don't necessarily learn how to drive the cars, maintain the cars, look after the cars, and they don't really understand things like uh, traffic laws and speed limits and that sort of thing. And the other sad fact is that more than half of them occur in young adults, usually young male adults. And the other very important thing to realize is that they don't die necessarily from the severity of their wounds. They die because of lack of basic resuscitation measures. And it's interesting. I'll tell you a story. In Niger some years ago, some bright spark in the Department of Health or the Ministry of Health uh, discovered that 80% of road traffic deaths in Niger were associated with big articulated lorries. So we had the idea that uh, what happens if we train lorry drivers in first aid? And uh, you won't believe it, but within two years, the pre-hospital mortality had gone down quite considerably. Not to naught, of course not, but it had come down quite considerably. Something simple, didn't cost a lot of money, and lots of things like that can be done in Africa. It doesn't necessarily have to be expensive interventions. And another sad fact is that injuries are predicted to become the third largest contributor 
the global burden of disease by 2020 and to increase by 83% in Africa. Uh, if you haven't been to Africa, uh, this is Nigeria, uh, where there's uh, two roads. One is coming up, which you can see uh, over there, and this is going down that way. Now, when there's a traffic jam, what you do is you simply cross over the lane in the middle and you start driving up the other way. And so it's no wonder that uh, a lot of injuries occur, a lot of crashes occur. The other thing to notice in Africa is that the roads, although they're tarmac, but at the edge of the road, it drops off quite considerably sometimes. In the wet, that sort of sandy stuff there gets very loose and buggy. And if one of those big lorries if the rear wheels or even the front wheels just go off the road into that soft bit, the whole lot can turn over. And we've seen that happening in, in, in real life. Um, Africans, uh, if for no other reason, are very resourceful. Um, within one day, someone has swiped the rear wheel off this car. Uh, and the chap, in fact, got out of here alive. Um, and this is, you see this all the time, I'm afraid, all the time. This is Nigeria's answer to Kill Bill. And uh, don't forget to remember the, uh, uh, the telephone number to call. Ambulances, people love donating ambulances to Africa. Um, and this sat there with this flat tire for four days that we were in this hospital. Nobody had attempted to uh, actually repair it. Motor bicycle ambulances, this is in Ethiopia, are very good actually. And these can truck up and down fields and dirt roads and what have you. Very effective, very cheap, and they run on uh, easily accessible fuel. Now, I mentioned obstetrics already, um, and you can see that over 500,000 maternal deaths occur a year. And uh, I'm not saying that we're proud, but in uh, Africa, accounted for about 99% of them. Um, one in 26 women die in labor, and that's better than the figures were a few years ago, where it was one in 22. And that's a terrible, terrible fact, that. You compare that with what we get in the UK. And of course, the incidence of obstetric fistulae are, is very high due to obstructed labor. Uh, you've got to remember that in Africa, you start having babies early, when you're 15, 16, 17. And if the first labor is prolonged, uh, the baby can die, get stuck in the pelvis, uh, and, the, woman, and the, the mother can die. If the mother survives, then they're left usually with a vesicovaginal fistula, and they're continually wet. They're outcast, uh, unless they can get an operation. Three million untreated fistulae in Africa alone. The emergency cesarean rate is very, very low. Now, some people are under the misapprehension that surgery in Africa is quite different to here in the UK. It isn't at all. The difference is that patients present late. This is a perforated bowel which occurred four days previously. Very quickly, this is a typhoid perforation longitudinal perforation, intersusception. Burns are very, very common, especially in kiddies under the age of five. Very, very common indeed. Malunited fractures, not conducive to full work. If you can't work, then you don't earn money and you can descend further into poverty. Not just you, but your family. Hernias, people go on about hernias a lot, and they are big. They are big. And this little girl here, who is 15, in fact, has been walking around with this lump on her back for 10 years, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The only reason she came to hospital was because she couldn't actually stand up. That was a lipoma. And the road traffic incidents are high, but internecine warfare is fairly high, too. Um, this is all facts of life. This is a, a guy who'd had shingles. Uh, the scars healed up as keloids, but the thing was, he was only 19. What's a 19-year-old doing with shingles? And, of course, he was HIV positive. There are 25 million people 
walking around Africa with positive HIV. 25 million. This is the mask that I was wearing. I used to take them out from the UK with this visor on. And um, you can see why you need to wear something for eye protection. Only about 20% of theatres in Africa have any form of eye protection. And you may say, well, if you wear glasses, isn't that good enough? Well, those of you who've worked in African theatres know that within five minutes, with no air conditioning, your glasses are right away down there. Moving on, training. <clears throat> One, three, four medical schools, 6,000 doctors annually. Nurses, midwives. The target, so the WHO tell us, is 2.3 healthcare workers per 1,000 population. And we will need an additional 600 medical and nursing schools at a mere cost of um, between 26 and $33 billion. Well, we'll pass on to the next slide. Uh, I said I'd talk about East Africa and COSEXA, which I am associated with, College of Surgeons of East, Central and Southern Africa. Uh, ten countries going from the top down. Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, Mozambique, Malawi, Zambia and Zimbabwe. Gradually getting bigger and bigger. Those are the countries that form COSEXA. Now, the surgical training programme uh, and I'm talking about for qualified doctors, is different from country to country uh, and is twofold. Um, you can enter university and do... Oh, I don't think my pointer actually works here. Uh, it doesn't. But you can do uh, one to five years on an MMED programme. When you qualify, you're an intern for one to two years, depending upon which country you're in. And then you tend to go out to a district hospital as a medical officer. Uh, and that's quite, the, quite a good experience for young doctors because they're really thrown into the deep end. And they have to often administer the hospital as well as actually perform clinical care. But if you want to become a surgeon, you've got to get onto a residency program. And that can take n number of years because they can only take so many each year. If they take 10 each year and there are 20 people who want to get onto the course, then they can't all do it. So they remain as an MO, medical officer, usually until such time as they can get onto a, a residency programme. Once they're on that, there are exams in the first, second year, and the final MMED, which is a degree, you take after your fifth year. Now, it was thought that the Af East Africa was not producing nearly enough surgeons. And was there another way of training surgeons? And the answer was yes. And COSEXA, uh, which was founded in 1999, uh, put forward a program whereby one could train in accredited provincial and district hospitals outside of the university. If you go on the university course, all your training is there. You don't rotate out to hospitals out round and about. And they introduce an MCS, which is a basic exam, equivalent to our MRCS, I guess. Not an exit exam. And that you can take in two years. The first year you have to do surgery and orthopedics and you have to be exposed to lots of emergencies. Um, now, 20% refers to 20% of people I interviewed some years ago who were doing an MMED program also took the MCS. They didn't have to, but they did. Uh, when you come out the other end, at the fifth year of the MMED program, you've finished your training theoretically, and you can apply for consultant jobs. That is, if they are available. Um, and often there's a big gap having finished then. They call themselves senior registrars or senior residents or what have you, waiting for a vacancy to occur. Now, if you're on the MCS program... Uh, when you've passed that, you can apply for an FCS. That's first, second, third year on the right there. Uh, and that will be for higher surgical training. And now we examine in general surgery, orthopedics and trauma, urology, plastic surgery, pediatric surgery, and neurosurgery. So those three years provide that higher surgical training. And there are opportunities during that time to work abroad if needs be. Uh, 
and I'll show you the success rate, or otherwise, of this system. Now, if you've got an MMED and you come out at the end of five years, you're, a, as far as general surgeon is concerned, you're a general sort of surgeon. And uh, if you're going to specialise, you need to do this FCS training as well, which you can do. If you've got an MMED or an MCS, you can do that training. And the FCS diploma is an exit exam. Now, there are problems with all this. There's difficulty with recruitment. Um, for quite some time now, a lot of those medical officers working in district hospitals were lured away by public health departments where they can get a mastership in one year. Join an NGO, get paid three times as much money, have the opportunity to travel abroad. Why not? The other problem is surgical training, just as it is here and as I've shown you, is uh, a long process. The exams are difficult. The pay is lousy if you get paid at all. And um, uh, as I say, the exams are difficult. So emigration and migration occur. Both are important. Um, people who have got to the end of their exams and they're qualified as a surgeon will want to work in the cities because that is where private practice is. The governments do not pay you very well at all. And so everybody aspires to gaining private practice in the cities. 90% of surgeons in Africa will work in the cities. If you can't get a position in the city, because there are only so many vacancies, then the willingness to go and work in the rural areas is very weak. Because, like in this country now, our spouses are often professionals. They're either doctors themselves, or lawyers, or teachers, or business people. And to be stuck out 200 miles away in some small town where there's no, uh, no hope to actually earn a living is very difficult where there's only primary education, where your kid's going to be educated for secondary and university. And so very, very few people actually want to go and work in the rural areas. So 90% of them will work in the cities, but 90% of the population live in the rural areas. This is a big problem. So because they're not paid, there are more opportunities abroad. Um, that's a push factor, the pull factor in America, as we know. 25, 30% of uh, residency posts are filled by IMGs, international medical graduates. And that figure, I am told, I am told, may get worse. Now, if emigration is bad, migration is just as bad because people will migrate out of medicine into administration. And you'll find permanent secretaries, uh, doctors or surgeons, uh, ministers of health are doctors. Uh, they get paid more money. They give up their clinical practice. So migration is just as bad as emigration. The postgraduate training program, uh, in terms of uh, audit meetings and morbidity and all that sort of mortality, x-ray meetings, past meetings, is virtually non-existent. If it is existent, it's not regular. It's not frequent. Uh, funding is a problem, of course. As the macroeconomy in Africa has gone up, this has not been reflected in the healthcare system. Lack of resources, for instance, in theatres, is not conducive to good surgery, let alone good training. Uh, so funding is a big, big issue. Infrastructure, you cannot take healthcare in isolation. If you have a, a woman who is in been in obstructed labour for three days and the nearest hospital that she can get to is 100 miles away and there are no roads and there's no transport, how the hell is she going to get there? If she starts walking, she'll die on the way. And it doesn't matter whether you've got one person in that hospital who can do a cesarean section or 100 people. If she can't get there, it ain't no good. Manpower, we've sort of alluded to. The government's way of tackling the manpower problem is to increase the number of medical students. They seem to see this as the way around to solve this problem. They increase the medical students quite heavily each year, but they don't increase the trainers. 
And of course, the more medical students that come through, <laughs> the more emigrate. If I were to tell you, and I have it on good authority, from a guy called Gordon Williams, who some of you will remember, in Ethiopia, 92% of medical graduates emigrate. 92%. But they bring some of this on themselves because uh, if you work as an NGO, in and for an NGO, you can't work for the government as well. Uh, and so they're not actually utilizing the doctors they've got. So manpower is a big problem. Um, the other issue is postgraduates, are they for service or for training? Something which has some sort of resonance here in the UK. Um, and this is a problem with do with pay. You see, if they're postgraduate students working in universities, the Ministry of Health say, well, that's, they're, 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 they come under the Ministry of Education. That's nothing to do with us, we won't pay them. The Ministry of Education say, yeah, but we don't pay students. What are you talking about? We never paid students in our lives. And so, in one big university hospital, I won't say where it is, the residents get paid nothing. When they're off duty, they have to moonlight down the town. In other universities, they are paid for the emergency surgery they do. That's important because the emergency surgery is essentially done by the residents. And I said to one resident, I said, well, what happens if in the middle of an operation and something goes wrong and you need some help? Do you phone your consultant? He said, oh, no, no. I said, well, who do you phone? I said, I phone a more senior resident. The consultants don't have the same sort of commitment. I'm not being rude or unkind when I say this, that we have here. Uh, many of them will regard their livelihood as being in private practice, not so much in the hospitals. And there's another big uh, international hospital, which I won't mention the name of, and there's a plaque outside the Department of Surgery, and it has about 20 names on it. And uh, I didn't recognise about 17 of them, and I said to some, I said, well, who are all these other guys? Do they turn up? No, they don't turn up. Why are their names there? Because they're chairman of this committee, or they're on that committee, or they're related to this, or related to that. So they're there for political reasons. So this is a problem. Lack of adequate remuneration. It's, and you say, why on earth they put up with it? They put up with it because, for better or worse, doctors are well respected in society in Africa. To be a doctor is to be somebody used to be like that here. Lack of annual and study leave, very, very flimsy indeed, if you get anything. No trainee representation. Um, and there is some conflict of interest between the MMED and the MCS programmes. Library facilities are poor. Internet access, everybody thinks that, oh, well, everybody's got internet now. That's no problem. We can do e-learning and all this sort of thing. Well, you can. But the problem with internet access is it's not reliable. Yeah, sometimes it can work beautifully for weeks and then suddenly it goes down. Uh, research opportunities, and this is something we're trying to do something about, uh, are very, very few. Uh, to be fair, they have to produce a dissertation for their MMED, and that's usually audit-based. And what they do is they look at um, the effect of HIV on wound healing in hernia repair and thyroidectomy and this and that and the other. So all their dissertations are based on that. Uh, massive amounts of research to be done. Uh, but the academic departments don't really get themselves involved. It, because it requires money, it requires time and everything else. Assessment and feedback for the trainees, virtually non-existent. Having said that, um, since 2004, when we started running exams in Kazexa, we have trained, or we have passed rather, 149 MCS and uh, 102 FCS. And that is good. That is really good. I think Kazexa have done an enormous amount of work to get all these guys up and running. Now, if you're going to send um, kit out for the guys in Africa, this is a photograph that was taken by Russell Locke sitting in the front row. Uh, I won't say where. I've actually blocked out. You could actually read where the yellow marks were, the address. Um, sent out by the Royal College of Surgeons of England, and we opened one of these boxes. Been sitting there for two years, and they contain the step course. 
Just think how much money it costs to send a lot out there. Two years sitting there, it'll be opened. So you've got to think how you assist these guys. Now, there are aids for education and training. We in ASGBI uh, have been running skills courses, basic surgical skills, which are similar to but not the same as that by the, the RCS. Laparoscopic workshops are run by uh, Paul Gartel sitting in the front row. Anastomosis workshops to be run by uh, Clive Quick, also in the front row here. Trauma surgery is not so much by us, but we're associated with it. Management of surgical emergencies, of course, we've just designed and run. And what is very important is a theatre and recovery nurse training course run by Sister Judy Mewburn, sitting also in the front row. And all these courses are preceded by a trainer trainers relating to those courses themselves. Where have we worked? 38 courses so far in 16 countries, West Africa as well as East Africa. And so far, participants on the courses, we've had over 500 for basic surgical skills, 84 for our MSE course, but that's only started a couple of years ago. Uh, Train the trainers for the pre courses, 294, and Judy's had about 342 to 350 nurses on her training course. Now, I mentioned resources, and if you're going to run courses, you do need to have electricity. And there are four things you need for electricity. One is a generator. Two is fuel in the generator. Three is a lead, which you can see. And the most important thing is a plug on the end of the lead. To get all four in one place at the same time is a uh, tremendous benefit. This little fella on the left was uh, our animal material for dissection. But I won't say what happened to him. Uh, Cosex uh, acts very much as a hub for specialist training. Uh, and by recognising and supporting centres of excellence, and we really need to have at least one per specialty. And we to utilise the uh, medical training initiative links in the UK. Um, and I've got one guy into the UK who came and spent two years in Birmingham, uh, learning all about renal transplantation. He's now gone back to where he came from to set up a renal transplant unit. It's a centre for coordinating postgrad courses, bursaries, grants. Um, but they also need to act as a consortium for research, which is something I'm interested in and trying to do something about, but it's not easy. And, of course, coordination with willing institutions as equal partners. We've now got 72 training hospitals which are accredited in 10 countries with e-learning platforms. <coughs> School for Surgeons from the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland, which is very, extremely good. The Ptolemy Project from Canada, um, promoting professional excellence and advancement through these labs and conferences and through the skills courses. Now, why have developing countries been slow to consider surgical care when surgically treatable conditions, such as you see there, occur? Well, there are a number of reasons. This uh, is a current UN global survey on what I call population aspirations. Um, they've had four million pickups so far, or hits, whatever you like to call it, and it finishes next year. Don't look at all the patchwork quilt, but if you look at the very top, in blue, you'll see that across the board there, whether whatever sex you are, male or female, however old you are, whatever education you've had, and whichever sort of um, income group you come into, every one of those groups put down education as number one. If you think about it, education affects everybody. Healthcare really only affects you when you're ill. You don't think too much about healthcare when you're well. Healthcare came second, that's the orange line, apart from the 31 to 45 year olds, I can't explain that, and oddly enough, the low-income groups, which is the fourth one from the right. What beat that? Better job opportunities. <clears throat> so even in Africa, healthcare is not top of the list. This is just uh, another myth you see people don't think about. There's no such thing as a national health service anywhere in Africa. Even if you're in a poor village, 
and you need to go to a clinic or you need to go to a hospital for treatment, for surgery, you have to pay. I mean, in some situations, you actually have to go and get the sutures, buy the sutures and the plaster and the drugs. You take them along, you hand them in, you get your operation. You have to pay. These, all these ladies here are making food for their kin. Now, why is it? Why is this situation going on? Well, if you look at it this way, governments don't tend to take much notice of members of parliament. They can jump up and down, but if the government doesn't want to listen, they don't. They don't really take much notice of the professional people either. What they do take notice of are the actual people on the ground. Now, I'll give you an example here in the UK. A few months ago, the government wanted to close Lewisham Hospital. Remember that? Okay. Did, um, and that was rescinded, that order. Was it due to MPs jumping up and down in Parliament? No, it wasn't. Was it due to the BMA or the medical professional or the colleges? No, it wasn't. It was due to people marching up and down the road with placards saying, don't close Lewisham Hospital and such like. Every day, this happened for a length of period of time, every day on the television, every day in the newspapers, on the radio, that's what made the government change their minds. Okay, you may say years time they'll pull the switch out then. In Africa, nobody is clamoring in the rural areas for better health care. You don't see people walking up and down in Africa with placards saying, we want health care. They've not been used to any form of health care for thousands and thousands of years. Each village will have its traditional healer, its bone setter, its birthing attendant. If you have five babies, at least one or two will probably die before they're aged five. But that has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. There's nobody clamoring. It's not as if they've had a health system having taken away from them. They've never had it. And it's not high up on their priorities either. There are ways we've got to get around that, which I'll come to in a second. One surgeon for every 196,000 people, only one for every 2.5 million in rural areas. And this is the need for surgery in these people. The blue bars are those who need it. And if you can actually see the brown bars, they're the ones who get it. There's a disparity somewhere there. The four types of surgery, I won't go into this in detail, we're talking about victims of injury, complications of pregnancy, acute abdomen, and then elective care for conditions which cause chronic disability. Uh, can we get round this by, and provide surgery somehow or other? Well, there's an enormous need, as I've just said. Rural hospitals have few, if any, surgeons trained to undertake essential surgery. They're poorly equipped, poorly maintained, haven't got constant running water necessarily, haven't got constant electricity, haven't got constant oxygen, and the, the saga goes on and on. The roads, the public transport, ambulances, communication is bad, it's better now with mobile phones, I grant you. So, as it so happened, non-physician clinicians, or clinical officers, health officers, they have a whole range of names, have been running in East Africa for some time. In Ethiopia, they started training them in 2009. In Malawi and Tanzania, those first dates in brackets are when some health officers were trained to do things like incise and abscess, stitch up simple wounds and things like that, and then went on to do caesarean sections. Caesarean section is, the emergency caesarean section is the commonest opera, emergency operation in Africa. But in 2004, 2005, for those countries there, they started training uh, health officers to deal with surgery across the board. Uh, and this, uh, I think, comes from the colleague sitting in the front row, Jamie Henry, from her paper, which shows you that it's in Mozambique, uh, where they had a terrible problem after the end of their so-called civil war, um, when they had no doctors or surgeons in the rural areas, and they had none in the cities either. And so they really had to get to grips with it quickly. And now you can see that virtually 90% of the 
of general surgery and C-sections are done by non-specialists. And you say, well, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Uh, what are their results like? Well, that's been audited many times. And invariably, they're just as good as outcomes from qualified surgeons, believe it or not. Now, they don't operate on everything, no. They are clearly defined areas where they can operate. If they open up a belly, a cute abdomen, uh, and they find a hell of a mess, there's blood here, there's feces there, there's pus there, and they can't do anything about it. Well, what they can do is they can do something about it. They can wash the patient out, they can pull them on antibiotics if they've got them, and stick a couple of drains in there, close them up, and transfer them, if they can. Or somebody may be coming down or coming their way could deal with it for them. So there's lots that they can do. <clears throat> and so training non-physician clinicians to undertake essential surgery is certainly a way forward. But it's not just training them for two or three years and then waving goodbye as they go back to their village. They have got to be registered, regulated, supervised, have some system of supervision, a career structure, CPD, appropriate pay, and accommodation. So it's a career move. It's not just an examination move and off you go. You've got to equip the hospitals, of course, to undertake the surgery and improve and maintain the infrastructure. Now, the International Collaboration for Essential Surgery, founded just a few years ago, uh, has this aim, really, of facilitating the training of MPCs to undertake 15 essential basic surgical interventions. I won't go into them in detail. Which can save lives and prevent permanent disability or life-threatening complications. But they've got to be of sufficient quality, easily accessible at all times, and affordable to the community. Haven't mentioned anaesthesia yet. A bit naughty of me, really. I firmly believe, actually, that uh, surgery and anaesthesia should be one word, because you can't do one without the other. A lot of anaesthesia is uh, spinal anaesthesia, ketamine, local, local blocks, etc. So we're, they, they get trained a little bit in, uh, in anaesthesia. A lot, there are a lot of anaesthetic health officers, and have been. I mean, there must be uh, 5% of the anaesthetics is delivered by a medically qualified individual in Africa. It may even be less than that, even in private practice. Um, they've got to be able to look after a theatre. Uh, you know, they've got to be able to sort of count swabs and things like this. Um, this isn't terribly good, I have to say. Uh, I wasn't actually responsible for all that. They've got to be resourceful, too. Um, uh, and here's the theatre I was working in, and uh, this thing exploded, these, this plug thing at the bottom here. And one guy went running out, came back with a huge pair of pliers, this big. He chopped those two wires off and joined them together again. Ten minutes later, off we went. Resourcefulness is their middle name. So why in Africa still today does a child commonly die? from acute appendicitis. Now, we wouldn't tolerate that here. Why have only 15% of strangulated hernias receive an operation? The rest die. We wouldn't tolerate that here. Why do thousands of teenagers in their first labour develop an obstetric fistula? We don't even see that here, or very, very rarely. Why do so many mothers die in childbirth? We wouldn't tolerate that for one moment. And why do millions of young people die or develop lifelong disability following trauma? We wouldn't tolerate that here. Why should they have to tolerate it there? What can we do? We, as the CanMeds model tells us, have to act as an advocate. And we must be their voice. And how can you do that? Well, we've got to incentivize governments. We've got to make them realize that they've got to do something about rural surgery, the rural populations. Not by going and shouting and banging and screaming and throwing money at the problem. That doesn't help at all. But getting to know the guys, there's nothing wrong with them. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of corruption in Africa, a lot of corruption elsewhere too. I'm not pointing fingers. 
But money doesn't always go where it's supposed to go. Or if it does, it goes via circuitous routes and bits get chopped off. But by talking and trying to make out as if it was their idea to actually make some beneficial change. So incentivising, and this is really what the Lancet Commission has got to get their head around, uh, because the problems are known, the governments know what's going on, they know what needs to be done, but they don't do it. They've got to be incentivised. So hopefully it's going to be a drip-drip procedure, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take several generations before we actually get real change. But we have got to be advocates for these people. You see this list of people here. Uh, and by, you can do it in all sorts of ways, just by going out and demonstrating, teaching people how to do operations, etc. So, Mr. President, I hope I have uh, given you some inkling about the, the problems in Africa, about the needs of Africa, as far as surgery is concerned, about the training methods that we can utilise, about the alternatives to medically qualified surgeons, and this huge question mark here. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.